Hello, everybody. Welcome to Most Wanted Topics. I'm your host, Kevin Dennison, along with me, Atomic Tommy, broadcasting to you from our studios here at Most Wanted Comics here in beautiful Bloomington, Minnesota. I tell you what, what an exciting week we have ahead of us. It is the week of the big game. The big game. The big game. Who's excited for the big game? We've heard all the hypes all this time. We've heard hype after hype after hype. We've heard all the analysis. We've heard all all the flashbacks, all all the all the highlights, all the predictions, and, and we gotta now get it's our, time. We got to we got to get our we got to get our predictions in. That's what I'm going to say. People want to know who does Atomic Tommy want to win the big game? The big game. Uh, I don't like the 49ers. Just straight up, I don't I don't want them to win. I don't. I mean, they're played well this season, but I don't. I don't like them, so I don't want them to win. So Plus, who are you cheering for? I, obvi- well, I don't know. Well, if it was Say up it. to me, if it was up to me, the Char- it. If it was up to me, the Chargers. But of course, obviously yeah. the Chargers aren't in, so got to be Kansas. You're City. a Herbert fan, good quarterback. Hey, they got a good coach. I know. That's, Big day. It's gonna be lightning. We're back, baby. It's gonna. It's, it's our year. Okay, no, we're not there yet. We're still talking about <laughs> this year and the big game. The big game. Obviously, I'm gonna have to go Kansas City. The power of the Swift. The Swifties are definitely I mean, running wild. Every Kelsey card in, in our store is gone. Do you need, <laughs> I mean, what kind of, what, I mean, look, when you have Taylor Swift on your side, do you even really need a good team? No. All you need is Taylor Swift. And the Entourage. Taylor Swift and the Entourage, you don't even need football fans. You just need Swift fee, Swifties. And then you don't even, you can just leave the team at home. Yeah. Swift will take care the, of the, the rest. power of the Swifties compels you. The power of the Swifties Taylor compels Swift. you. <laughs> Taylor Swift's over there, like, hang on, fellas, I'll take it from here. And I wonder if she's just going to jump into the halftime show and says, uh, "No, no, no, let me handle this." Usher's mm-hmm. just a cover, <laughs> just a cover for Swift. She's going to whirl. Can up. you believe a surprise? Would, would the NFL not benefit? I mean, they've gotten so much free. I mean, the free bump in ticket sales, the the advertising revenue, just a fact because. She is the girlfriend of, of Kelsey that all of a sudden the NFL benefits so much and now they said, Sorry, Usher, you got to go. I think it <laughs> I think it'd be great. <laughs> Taylor if, Swift's here, she got this. I think it'd be great if the head coach of uh, the Chiefs, like before this season, right? Absolutely hated Taylor Swift. He's like, Oh, you got damn kids in there, Taylor Swift. Oh, God, I hate it. And now that she's in the sense, she's like, please, please shake it off, Taylor. I love you. Shake it off. Just let me get it, please, Taylor. I love your music. Just a complete 180. I, that's what I like to think in my head. Yeah, and, and if California, the 49ers, if they lose, are they going to say, why you got to be so mean? You know? What if, <laughs> <laughs> why, you know I mean, I mean, come on now. Let's, let's think about that. We're going to have to go down Taylor Swift's songs for the, <laughs> for the big game. For the big game. <laughs> Yeah, she, you gotta, yeah, you got to yeah. root for the anti hero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's the anti hero. She's, the anti, she's the anti-hero. Okay, I've had no, it's, it's the big game talk it's with Kevin game. and Atomic Tommy. Big game talk. Big game. The big game. The big game. And yes, there will be no ads here. So NFL, you can suck it because we're not saying the big game word that you can't say. We're just saying the big game like we're supposed to say. The big game. Which is the dumbest thing in the world. You can't. I mean, come on. You, you can't say the s word. Why not? We already let it out slip once. Who cares? All right. Go ahead. Whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is, we're rooting for Kansas well, City. Like 30 people watch this. We're in the Midwest. We're Minnesota, damn it. We're cheering for a Midwest team. I'm not a fan of California. Yeah, California. Suck it. We're not going to cheer for you. So, <laughs> yeah, Cali. Yeah, suck it. <laughs> that is to the governor of California. You can just suck it. <laughs> <laughs> suck it. All right. But we do like Purdy. Yeah. I, I, I'm a fan of pretty. He's a good quarterback, and uh, Kansas City's going to have their hands full. Yeah, yeah. Well, McCaffrey's really good. We'll so. just have to see what happens next week at the bigger. So we'll have a recap of every. Everybody's going to want our take on the big game after the it's over. But game. but anyway, that's enough of the big. That's enough now. Now when we're we have a great show today. Uh, let's talk some. You know what we have? Grammy award winning. Uh, guest people, uh, Dan Schlesel is in the house, and he's going to be coming in for an interview here real quick. But uh, we got to recap uh, some of the comics that came out and what we have to look forward to. Uh, so, uh, Tommy, I'm going to let you take it away here with uh, what came out and what we have to look forward to. Yeah, so uh, this week, 
again, it was one of those weeks where not really a whole lot came off for me. I read some stuff, but instead of going over, you know, some decent titles, you know, and the, the titles that came out this week were not bad. Uh, Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099 is pretty good. Uh, Avengers Twilight still remains good. Duke remains good. But instead, I wanted to talk about something. I think I talked about the first issue back when it came out, but that's Titans Beast World. Uh, that's DC's big event going on right now. Just ended, you know, this past week with issue six. Underrated. And, well, actually, I didn't read it after issue one. Um, I, and I wanted to kind of talk about why. Because we had a couple people asking, you know, have I read it? What do I think? Especially around uh, Tom Taylor's other titles. And I kind of wanted to say why. Because, again, I didn't read Beast World after issue one. And I happen to be a guy that actually really likes really likes Tom Taylor's work. I think he's a great writer that does some great stuff. Nightwing is an amazing title. You know, again, I know I said I don't really read it, and I and I don't really read it, but I have read it in the past with Taylor writing it, and uh, you know, it was great then. People say it's great now, and I believe him. Uh, he's just a great writer all around. A lot of his stuff with John Kent is really cool, even though John Kent's not really my favorite character. I still really like what he does with that character, and I still think uh, Tom Taylor is really good. But and Titans, Tom Taylor is writing the current ongoing Titan series, and that's really good. But uh, to all that, I haven't read Beast World, and the reason why I think is because of the reason why a lot of people also didn't read, it, and that's event fatigue in comics. You know, there's a million events that go on all the time, and I just and a million reboots, a million, re- a million reboots, and I just it. It's just, I'm over it. <laughs> I'm over it. You know, the first issue of this was okay. The premise was always a little, I don't know, I just wasn't really as into it as other people might have been. I always thought the premise was just kind of a little a little too far for me, I think, and it just wasn't, just didn't really grip me. Um, and to be honest, again, you know, there doesn't, does there really need to be a, an event this soon? The Titans are so, are. DC's new Justice League after uh, Dark Crisis. The Justice League all retired and the Titans became the new big superhero team. And they already have a big event and they haven't even really had a chance to, you know, form themselves as a team. They haven't really had a chance to really dive into what does that look like? How are they, you know, fitting? How are they filling those shoes? They haven't really had a chance to do that yet uh, in their own title and as characters. And they're already being thrown into this big event. And it's just it just feels too soon for me, and I can't speak to what happened in the book because again I didn't read it. Maybe they did a good job. You know, maybe Taylor did a really good job building that and you know doing all that stuff. But it's worth picking up and reading. If you yeah, I'm we not, still have some copies at the shop. Come I'm not yeah, up. I'm not gonna say don't read it, but it's just I don't know. I didn't read it. I think there's too many events going on right now, and for those of you who are wondering why, that's why. That's why you're protesting. Stand your ground. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I mean, I'm not protesting the bug. I don't think it's bad. I just personally. Why you got to uh, be so mean? Well, yeah. Nice callback. I just I just personally want to see less events and more focus put into, like, the main titles, you know? There doesn't need to be an event for everything. That's true. That's true. Yeah. All right, I agree well, with you on that. Coming right. up this week. It's a, it's a, now, this week is a big week. We've been building to this. Coming from, I think, Dynamite Comics, I think, has this coming out. Thundercats, number one. Thunder That's going to be a big one. Yes. Personally, I don't, I, I know it's an 80s cartoon. I don't really know much else beyond that. Uh, but Thundercats, for those maybe interested, I doubt it'll be as big as Transformers. Not going to uh, be as big as Transformers. Not going to be as big as G.I. Joe, but still an, a, a nostalgic title that I think a lot of people read number one just to check it out. Yeah. I think well, people, people, and you know, and I'm sure the Mighty Mafu is going to have something to say about Thundercats after it comes out. He'll oh, yeah. Do and he'll probably line up with the toys uh, or a toy or two and then uh, also talk about the book when it comes out. Big week for Marvel. Star Wars Mace Windu number one, a new Star Wars Mace Windu title. I mentioned I'm not a huge fan of modern Star Wars comics, but like Thrawn, I'll give it a read and check it out. And the big one, Ultimate Black Panther number one, Will... It happened again. Is that going to be hyped up? I don't know. It could, for all I know. I don't know. It's, I don't know what to think now, anymore. Now, for those of you that are concerned 
that book will be cover price. <laughs> yes. When it comes out of the it's store. It's important to remember for those who are maybe concerned that book will start at $5.99. I'm not sure what the cover price is. It's either $4.99 or $5.99. My guess $5.99. But who knows what it'll be a week later. We don't know what it'll be who a couple knows? weeks from now. But, but you know... Um, I'm not sure, you know, we're, we're going to go with what the market does, you know. I, I, and maybe I think, we'll sell I, I out think again. we need to say something about that. The Ultimate Spider-Man number one has been a big thing right now. The book, and plain and simple, the book is not worth cover price anymore. And no business, no shop, no seller with rent to pay, with, with expenses, is going to purposely lose money on something like that. Especially not as something as volatile as that book. That comic is not going to be $60 forever. In fact, it's already stabilized. I don't think the book's going to go any higher. In fact, as soon as the second prints come out, as soon as a new shipment comes out, it's going to go lower. So you dive only, down it, it's so going to dive down eventually. It's just, it's not practical and it's not logistical. A book is not, a book may be cover price for $5.99, but it's not worth $5.99. People are upset that, you know, we're pricing it above cover price. And that other businesses are pricing to cover price. And I get it. You didn't get one. Sorry. But at the end of the day, it's not worth cover price. But it's sold out at cover price. It's sold out at cover price. And, Two there's weeks a reason, later. and there's a reason for that. Business, a lot of shops, including us, didn't over order on this book. They didn't order a lot of copies. No, we sold out. Nobody buys new comics. So how are we going to predict that this book is going to be hot? All these businesses sold out because nobody thought to order it. So the next batch came in. Was the market had set the price a higher couple of weeks later? And I don't even know if Black Panther is going to be as expensive. It's just it may be the hype because of Ultimate Spider Man number one. Who knows? What I think it will. I think that book's going to sell out. I don't Probably know if it'll will, be but as I think that'll be on the coattails of because yeah. of what happened with Ultimate. Yeah. So I think that'll be a spec spec. Yeah, I think it will. Yeah, I, I think it'll flop. But <laughs> yeah. who knows? Who knows? We'll know in two weeks, and we'll see. We'll see what happens if we have mm-hmm. any left or not. But anyway. Let's move on here. We're going to, anything else to add before we move on? Nope. I think we're good. All right. We're going to take a quick commercial break with our boy, Jimmy Hart, and then uh, we'll be back with Dan Sleasel, everybody. Hey, it's me, the mouth of the sound, Jimmy Hart. Hey, Most Wanted Comics is where I go to get all of my comics, even my back issue comic books, and toys like Star Wars, G.I. Joe, Marvel Legends, and even wrestling figures. Hey, if you want to check it out, you can check out mostwantedcomics.com. Or, or be there in person like I go in person. It's 9919 Lindell Avenue. It's Bloomington. Bloomington, Minnesota. That's what I like to call it. Most Wanted Comics. It's great, baby. All right, everybody. I've been waiting for this interview. We are here with the famous Dan Schliso. He is the producer and head of Stand Up Records and also a Grammy Award winner and a three-time nominee. And he won that Grammy Award in 2007 for the 2006 album, Lewis Black's The Performance in Carnegie Hall. And uh, let's welcome Dan Schliso. <laughs> Little claps for the most wanted comics community out there. They'd they love to hear this. Um I got to tell you, Dan, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, I want to get into some things about, you know, not only the Grammy experience, but, uh, you know, people are wondering, like, what is stand-up comedian? How, how does that relate to comic book topics? Well, we're going to talk about that today. Let's talk about your roots a little bit and uh, what inspired you, what comics inspired you. Uh, how did all this comedy come about for you? Well, comedy was kind of a lifelong thing I, from the time I was a little kid. Uh, my aunt in New York, we, we used to live in New Jersey when I was a little tiny kid. So we were about a half hour outside of the city and my folks were young parents, you know, they wanted to get out and have fun. So that would mean ditching me with the, uh, with my aunt. Okay. And, uh, they always gave my aunt and uncle and, uh, my cousins like very strict orders that I should be in bed by seven o'clock. But then the next morning at breakfast, I'd be reciting lines from Carson's monologue or the first season of SNL, you know, always up way too late watching TV with my cousins. I'm guilty of watching TV too late. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So from that stuff, you know, comedy was, was what really appealed to me. Things that were funny that you could say the next morning and get a laugh from people and they'd shake their heads, you know, your family, your, your first audience, and uh, that's where the love of comedy really started was was back then. Okay. And then uh, at about the same time, a couple years later, maybe I was I have my first comic book still, and that's Marvel Star Wars fourteen. Okay. And uh, Star Wars fan, that's cool. Yeah. Well, you know, it came out when I was you know a kid, so that was the thing. And uh, 
I loved it. It sparked my imagination. And then I seeing a comic book on a, on a newsstand shelf or a grocery store shelf. It was, uh, it was really, it was kind of mind blowing that there was this extension to that universe, mm-hmm. you know, cause you only had that one movie and there wasn't anything else. So <laughs> like that, it, that was great. That was even before the star Wars holiday special. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I just grabbed onto that and I still have it. It's beat up. Okay. You know, the cover's been restapled on a couple times and corners are coming off. And Well, but, for the comic collector, the first comic is always special. It doesn't matter how ragged it gets. You're going to keep it or keep rebuying that book just because of I had it and I destroyed it and I want it back because it was the first comic that either someone gave to you or you bought. Or I, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah, and you're 100% right. I have like three copies of it, but the the most important one is that first one that I still have. That's maybe my, it might not be most monetarily valuable comic that I own, but it's the most valuable comic that well, I own. Of course, because, yeah. yeah, just just the nostalgia of it. So yeah. what else did you get into reading? The Star Wars is there, and then did that take you off in other directions? or? Well, then I kind of discovered, you know, Mad Magazine and Cracked and Crazy, all, uh, all imitators of Mad. And, uh, that it's a drastic separation from Star Wars to Matt. Not really, really, because I think my first issue was the Star Wars musical. Oh, on the cover. oh, oh gotcha, gotcha. So I, you know, I think that was like a Mort Drucker drawing of the, of the cast and characters. And that was a real easy jump from one to the other. Okay. And there yeah. were certain things that were fluid between mediums back then. Cause you had like kiss was a band that had trading cards set, a comic book, a TV show. You know, so there was a lot of stuff like that that would cross into multiple sure. formats. Yeah. And and that kind of pulled me into satire and parody, which reinforced the love of comedy that I already had. And I think I think my second comic book was a couple years later after, uh, and it was uh, Tales of the Green Lantern Corps number one. Okay, cool. Yeah. But uh, I, I very quickly kind of got into it from there, and then we moved... By that point, I'd already lived in Pencil. We moved to Pennsylvania, and then right away from 81, 82 is like when we moved to the middle of Nebraska. So, okay. you know, it's a pretty drastic change. And one thing that was constant, even though, you know, all my friends had changed over and there were new situations, one thing that was constant was there was always newsstands, there was always comic books, there was always magazines. The local drugstore. Local drugstore. Yep. And, and we were lucky enough in that town to have a local comic shop. That's cool. And uh, you said Lincoln, Nebraska? No, this was actually in Kearney, Nebraska. Oh, Kearney. Us, okay, okay. Which is even further west. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we were in the middle of nowhere. But okay. we had a comic shop because there was a little college campus in town. Okay, that's cool. Well, yeah. that, that, that the college campus is always always big for comic book stores. I mean, that, the college kids love, love their comics. Yeah, and the funny thing is our comic store was called Donna's Book Nook, and it was Donna was basically into romance novels. Okay. So most of the store was romance novels. With a few comics in between. And and then over the years, it just overwhelmingly changed to comics. Different owner? No, same owner. Just that, you know, used, used romance novels didn't sell as well as comic books. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So then now you got it. You got it in your comics. You moved to Nebraska. Still comedy's a passion here? Or we're yeah, getting... comedy's always stayed a passion, and, and rock and roll music as well. Okay. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I keep forgetting you do music, too, besides. did, yeah, yeah. yeah. I kind of dabble now and again uh, currently, but for the oh, most part, sorry. it's, it's uh, straight up uh, comedy at this point. Well, that's all right. Now, how did you get into, like, uh, did you, did the Mad Magazine and those types of books, did they inspire some of the jokes and some of the, just some of the the background you, you needed to be with some of these people, these comedians, to help out with, with. Yeah, I mean, you know, comic books and and Mad Magazine get a lot of grief for being juvenile, you yep. know, and they have since the beginning. I mean, Mad started in fifty two, and it was getting banned from classrooms, right? Yep. But uh, I also find that my vocabulary is probably way more enriched by by some of the comic books that I've read. I uh, would have never seen the word booyah base in print if it weren't for comic books. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it just really expanded the vocabulary because it wasn't just for kids. It wasn't all Richie Rich. It was, no, you know. The term funny books, everything, it does. They, they always kind of laugh it off and they just say, yeah, it's just funny books, just funny books. But there is a lot of educational value to comic books. I think so, too. I, You know, both my kids learned to read when they when they struggled reading when they were little. 
uh, comic books help them. I mean, just by the story mapping they can do, inferences you can make, what's going to happen next, the prediction. And then, and then looking at the picture, you can actually help sound out words. You can kind of figure out the words just by the pictures. There's so many uh, things going on in the head when you're learning to read, and comic books kind of combines all that. Yeah, it's very, nice very great to have the visual context of what's going on. So. Yeah, to help. And then you kind of understand the words, and you can understand the meaning, too, of the words. And so besides just learning the words, you kind of learn the meaning of the words. And just there's so much value to a comic. And, and we try to emphasize that enough. We have a kid's corner in our store, and uh, the parents do appreciate that now because what I tell the parents when they come into the store is that, hey, if your kid's in first grade, this book is per- perfect because it's going to have all their sight words on it that they're going to need to learn anyway. Right. And if this book is age-appropriate, all your high-frequency word lists for your grade level are going to be in this book. And what better way for a kid to get lost in Superman or, or a superhero fun story and learn your sight words at the same time without knowing it. And right. also learn, like, the meanings of them, at, you know, without having to sit there and memorize the definition. Right. It's, yeah. yeah, so I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. All right, so now we, 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 we've, we like, we, we bought Star Wars. We got superhero comics. We got Mad Magazine in the fray. You like rock and roll. And then you also, I know you just from a customer at the store, you like horror magazines. I like horror magazines, but uh, that... It's a weird thing for me I, because of Mad Magazine, you know, you want to research more about it. So when I was a kid, I checked out of the library, uh, the Mad World of William M. Gaines. Okay. Right. So when I'm reading that, I then discover that he had a comic book company that Mad came out of, EC Comics. So and, you dive deeper. So you dive a little deeper. And, you, and, and that was about the time that Russ Cochran was putting out the complete EC library, which if the listeners don't know, are these pretty big slip cased book sets that have uh, all the EC original art reproduced in black and white. And it's, it's the full line of EC comics pretty much from the right about the new trend on until they die as a comic company. Well, EC is still popular today. Yeah. People still like the horror and, and heck, I mean, what HBO did tales of the crypt. Yes. All the stuff from the EC. I mean, tell you what, that's still, it's still so popular. I mean, people like that stuff. Yeah, and I think what makes it popular is that it's pretty pretty well written and even in their horror comic books it's and funny. Getting, they're funny. They funny. have snap endings, there's a lot of wordplay and and to me that is really where my interest in horror is because uh I liked horror as a genre as a kid, and the older I've gotten the less I've liked it as a genre myself because I've been through some horrific stuff. Yeah. But that being said, I still enjoy that comedy aspect. And if you dig into when Mad started, the first cover of Mad Magazine has um, a family cowering in terror in a spotlight with a, like a shadow of a monster on the floor. What is that? It's Melvin. <laughs> well, that's to show you there's some humor in there, but most of the actual humor comics that imitated Mad in the 50s also sprang out of the horror genre. Yep. And the stuff I'm looking for when you, that you know me for horror from is I'm looking for where those humor crossovers are. Yep. Yep. Because I'm, I'm trying to study that stuff more as a, as a field now, as I've gotten back into comic collecting for the third time in my life. (laughs) The third time. Yeah. Wow. I tell you what though, that I, it's really hard to find though. Those books are hard to find in good condition. They are hard to find. They're very hard to find in good condition. The thing about those books is I don't, I, I don't need to be too worried about the condition because I want to read them. Right. So, like, I, I just literally got something where this, the cover of the spine was almost entirely split. Yeah. And, and for my collection, it's a little bit of a bummer. But for my reading, it's an absolute Perfect. pleasure. Yeah. yeah. I, get, I get that. So now let's take in... How did we get into now we're producing our, our, our it, it, this is something you wanted to do out of college? This is... So, yeah, I got more and more into bands. Okay. And then I went to college. This is, you know, the summer of 1988, the the, the fall semester. And I, I moved the to Lincoln. The late 80s. <laughs> yeah, the late 80s. Uh, moved to Lincoln, Nebraska to go to the university. And uh, other people on my dorm floor were into bands as well. And, and it just became like go to the record stores all the time, buy records, listen to records, talk about records, and then try and cram in your homework in between. So I did that for a number of years, and then I, re- then I started working at a record store. I got hired to manage a record store, a brand new store in Lincoln called Feedback, owned by uh, Todd Grant and uh, 
Barry Botger. Do they sell comics too, or just no, like just this? just music. Okay, and okay. Uh, the the long and short of it is that I started helping book bands at the university, local bands. Okay, uh, from Lincoln, Nebraska. I found I found out about local bands in the college newspaper, and it really sparked my interest because I I you know I thought bands were from New York and Los Angeles and London and Nashville, not from Lincoln, Nebraska. Right. <laughs> but it turns out any place you can buy an instrument, you can start a band. Sure. If you, if you have the gumption, you can write your own songs. Yep. And that idea kind of set my head on fire. So I started booking bands and working at the store and I was buying records for the store from a distributor. And then I just kind of in conversation was talking to my uh, salesperson. I said, if I made a record for a band, would you guys pick that up? And she was like, yes, automatically we'll pick it up. Wow. Okay. So then that kind of made me pull out my credit card. Well, not quite my credit card. I pulled together all the money I had. And then I talked to my brother and I talked to the bar owner where most of the local original bands played. Okay. And they kicked in a little bit and we put out a CD for a band from uh, Lincoln and Kearney, Nebraska, two guys from each and the band was called Such Sweet Thunder. The The record was called Redneck. Uh, this is now the 30th anniversary of Redneck's release. Wow. So, Congratulations. Thank you. I tell you what, uh, it's amazing how the entrepreneurial spirit, when you, when you have an idea and you have your mind to something, what you can really accomplish and figure out how to make it work, you know. If you stumble into a direction, it mm -hmm. makes a difference. And I... I don't think I'd have ever gotten to making records if I hadn't worked at the record store and realized, hey, I know bands. I know places where I can sell stuff. Yeah, it helps a lot. Yeah, it just really was the culmination of stuff. So I put out that record in November of 92, and by uh, by May of 93, the record was paid off, and all my uh, investors were paid off. Oh, that's awesome. So six months it took, and, and that was it. And we... We did felt like you made it too, you know, like big time. Yeah, know? I was hand assembling those records. Like, uh, you know, I, I had the CD manufacturer make a, like stacks of CDs. They, they shipped them to me. I found, because uh, I worked at a record store, I had a source for used jewel cases. Found a local print shop that was two blocks away from the, uh, from the record store. And I was literally in the record store working, selling records, and then assembling CDs to, to sell. Nice. Yeah. And then, how long did it take to do back then? Because now, I mean, look at these split. How long did it take back then to do that? I mean, that took about a week. A week? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, off and on, because you had to deal with customers too. Yep. So, um, you know, I knew my thing was the secondary thing, and I was kind of getting away with it on the clock. So, but, but if you're on the clock, you pay attention to the clock when the clock says, hey, we need <laughs> you. Yep, time to go. And my boss was cool about it because I had everything under control at the store. I didn't let that slide to make records. Happen. Nice. So now you're making records. Now you're working at the store, and now we get in, we're getting into the comedy too. No, this was about six years of stuff in Lincoln, and the store went away. I went to another store. Didn't have a manager job. Okay. And and, and then slowly got into tech support for different companies. So that's how I funded everything. And, and we moved out. I moved out of the dorm after I graduated. Got an apartment. My first warehouse uh, was uh, my dorm closet and under my bed. <laughs> Okay. So for a long time, the, Perfect the, the mailing address was the dorm room. Okay. And if you have one of the old records, it, it'll have that mailing address on there. Oh, but nice. so from there, I moved out, did all that stuff. Couldn't maintain a job after six years in Lincoln, Nebraska, because there's always a churn of low cost labor. Sure. You know, as the new students graduate. So I, I found a job here in the Twin Cities. Okay. Well, out in Wisconsin, actually, in Hudson. Um, Close enough. And that was all I needed. Um, so I commuted every day out to Hudson and back Okay, and, uh, I was still, I doubled my salary. I was doing well, was engaged to get married and just, uh, driving back and forth to Hudson. I had, uh, I heard on the radio station, I was listening to this station. that was like, um, Howard Stern in the morning and then, um, metal in the, in the evenings and afternoons. So I'd listen to Howard Stern driving out in the morning for the year or two it was on. Okay. And then uh, on the way back, it was, I the metal station said, oh, tonight at the uh, at Acme Comedy Company, Lewis Black from The Daily Show. And this is um, March of 99, so he's not really, really famous yet. Right. And I was already a fan because I'd seen him on a couple of Comedy Central half-hour compilations of comedians. And uh, 
I just went to my apartment, called the club, got directions, wrote them down, grabbed a stack of music CDs I'd put out, and then just headed to the club. And I handed all the stuff to an usher, watched the show, and thought, well, at rock venues, if the band is big, you don't see them after. They go out the back door, they're gone. Right. Well, I hope it gets to them. But Acme, when you're in there, you walk by basically this big glassed-in wall of a fishbowl, which is, which is the bar. Okay. So you can see the bar whenever you're in the hallway there. And walking out of the showroom, you walk by that same bar, and there's Lewis Black just standing in the middle of the bar. Okay. Just looking at the audience leaving. So I went over and introduced myself, asked if he'd got the, the stuff, which he hadn't yet. And I just pitched him right there. I said, hey, I'm going to produce these records. I'd love to have you on the label. Or? Yeah, I've never worked in comedy. I've been a fan of yours for a while. I think you're like this guy and that guy. I really like it. I'd like to like to work with you, make a comedy record. Wow. And, mm. he, and that was in March of 99. Okay. My wife hadn't moved up here yet. We hadn't gotten married just yet. Um, she was in Lincoln preparing for all that stuff. I, call, I ran over to the uh, Stribs Printing Press, which is right by Acme. And I got myself into the building and got on a payphone and called called my wife and told her. A payphone, people. A that pay wasn't there. <laughs> the, a payphone is like your cell phone, but it's like fixed to the wall, and then you put money in it to talk. <laughs> For those awesome. of you that are too young to know what a payphone is. Um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah, payphone. You don't even hear that nowadays. That's awesome. So, so you got the payphone. You called your wife. Super happy. Yeah, and then... Basically, I didn't even think to take Lewis's contact information. Oh, no. No, no. It's okay. I called the club, and I explained what happened. They gave me his manager's number. I called the manager. And we talked between March and uh, November. And I had to figure out where his tour was routed. It was going to Madison. I knew a guy that owned a recording studio in Madison from my band days. So I called him to see if he could do it. And we, we arranged for that. He was there the day before me cause he lived in town. I had to wait till Fridays till I got off work <laughs> and, uh, my wife and I headed to Madison and we were at the shows all weekend. And at this point, Lewis said yes to recording, but we hadn't had a deal in place even. Oh, we're wow. just doing all this. So you're just faith. all just on a handshake and a, mm-hmm. okay. All right. So we did when he was, he said he wanted us to come over for dinner. So we did that. And while we were talking, he's like, I think this is great. You know, Warner Brothers passed on me. Comedy Central doesn't make records. You know, I'd like you to keep doing my stuff. I love what's happening this weekend. And it was like everything you want to hear. And he got up to, you know, hit the restroom. And I looked at my wife like, is this happening? Even like... You're hearing this, right? Yeah, he's ready to go. We're in, and you haven't even got a contract signed. Not yet, but we had one signed not very long thereafter. Okay, good. So I, my first comedy album is Lewis Black's White Album, which is his first comedy album. Okay, good. That, and that's how I started making comedy records. That's a hell of a story. Yeah. That's an awesome story. Yeah, yeah. You, you it know. shows, and, and I, want, I want people to hear this. I've been trying to teach my kids this, too. It's okay to cold call. Yeah. Because you never know. The worst they could say is no. And if they say no, that's the same as if you didn't ask, so why not ask? Yeah, that's exactly. You know, yeah. Gretzky put it a different way. When you miss 100, 100% of the shots you don't take. Yeah, exactly. You know, you got you to gotta stick your chin out there. And a lot of people today, I think, lack that skill because they're so afraid of rejection. And I get that. But you know what? Putting yourself out there says you have character and you're willing to try. Yeah, hard work. And I think that sticking your chin out, taking risk and failing is okay because learning to fail is, a, is an important skill to learn how to overcome failure. The overcoming failure is the <laughs> skill you need and to learn. And we've all been there yeah. where we failed several times. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, I mean, we've all failed and stuff we've tried, but, but we keep sticking our chins out. We keep trying to do stuff, you know, and I, I have so much, so much respect for you in going out there. You saw what you liked, you grabbed it, you know, and, and the person took to you right away. And now you have an album. And now when am I going to step into this? Yeah, please. When did you get your, you're a three-time Grammy nominee. Yeah. Did one of those get nominated also beside before the Carnegie Hall album or? One album before Carnegie Hall did. And was it Lewis Black's? It was. Basically, I knew, you know, there's a TV series, Man Moment Machine, right? Where it talks about like the convergence of technology and people. And like your moment in time. So like disregard that now, but that man moment machine moment happened when I was talking to Lewis. Sure. So I knew 
I knew I had lightning in a bottle, even though it hadn't really been fully unleashed yet. Right. I just, I knew it was my time. So the minute that we started doing business and the record started doing well, I immediately found out how do you register for the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, also known as the Grammys. Mm -hmm. How do you register? How do you get your album listed in their nominees list? How do you, how do you start the process of getting an artist recognized? And this is a dumb question. And did you have to do a union too, like actors do? Like, you know how actors No, no, there's them? no producer's union that I'm aware of. Okay, I just was curious. I didn't know because you know how actors, when they start out, they have to be part of the union. Or, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's not, I'm not acting. I'm making records. So I get it. I, I don't know if it was the same type with the music or not. So. I don't believe that there is. I mean, maybe somebody in the audience knows a little more than me. In well, that it doesn't regard. really matter anyway because yeah. you made it without it anyway. Yeah, you know, sometimes you do stuff and you just don't know what you don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is a lot of the case for me. <laughs> Trial but, and error, man. Yeah, exactly. And and then making up for those errors. It's easier to apologize after. Yeah, yeah. it's better to ask forgiveness <laughs> than permission sometimes, yeah. So I knew right away this record was something. Yeah. So I went ahead and... Uh, applied to the national recording Academy, got in, got the record into the, what, what they, there's three rounds of voting, two rounds of voting. There's the initial round. Then there's the final round, right? So in the initial round, you're nominating stuff and then people vote. What you do is you submit it. You see, you, you have an application, you submit the application, you send in the record and you see if you make it onto the first sure. list. So we did that. And I knew you know, there's no, he's not known here. And a lot of the people in this list are known, but this will at least start establishing him as an artist that these judges will see over time. And back then the Grammys were a little different. You had to send in the records. People had to listen to the records. You know, it wasn't just a go off and listen to it on your own sort of thing. Cool. And, and there was a thing called the Grammy guide that you would then submit your records to. And that would go out to everyone people would go through the, it was like a check mark list, like a record club. And you just check the records you'd want and you'd get them at a discount. Okay. So I submitted to the Grammy guide and that way I got it into the hands of people further away from me than, than just here in the twin cities or just cool. Lewis's fans. More reach. Yeah. And so we built that over time. I did two records and an EP with Lewis on my label, but then he got signed to comedy central's record label. They started about two years after me. Okay. And you're just not going to compete with Viacom. No, but the point is you did it. Yeah. You got there. Yeah. <laughs> the, screw whatever else happened. You got, you did it, man. You made it to the pros. Right. Right. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Like if you make it for a day, you, like I always dreamed of making it to professional baseball. I want to be a baseball player or whatever. Right. I wouldn't care if I just made it for a day. You're on the books as you're a professional baseball player. You made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter if you're there for, you made it. And they can't ever take that away from you. Exactly. And now you got a nice trophy on your wall saying that, hey, Well, we weren't even it. quite to that point yet. But when, <laughs> once he signed to Comedy Central, he kept me as his producer. That's awesome. So I produced his first four albums for Comedy Central. Well, that's awesome. It was the second, third, and fourth albums that got nominated. The third album was the Carnegie Hall performance. Okay. And that's the one that won. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you feel like just all this hard work? I mean, when you got to get that award, you know, I mean. It was, it, I mean, there's always, you know, entertainment's weird because there's highs and lows at the same time. He got nominated three times. His managers just did not say, hey, you should come to the Grammys. They just never reached out and said, hey, you should come. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So the year that we won, I wasn't there. No, but you still got the award. I got the award. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I did. I, I, I mean, there's a process to that, too. It's not like they just send you the award. <laughs> right. But uh, I got the award as the producer you, you're entitled to uh, to the statuette. So I, uh, or you're entitled to, to have the opportunity to get one. Right, <laughs> right. That's probably the better way to put it. But I went ahead and did all that because the music I cared about before I started doing comedy was not mainstream. Sure. So like most of the bands that I like a lot, most people haven't heard of, you know, that's just the nature of what I like. Right. So none of those bands would have ever, they would have scoffed at a Grammy, but here I am. I have one, Yeah. you know, you got me. Yes. Credibility. It, it's yeah. It, it's, it's a neat little credit to have. It's a, it's the credibility to the resume and shows that you accomplish something. You're willing to work for something. And yeah. I, I think it's great. Um, so anyway, yeah, three-time nominee, one-time winner. You got to work with 
a bunch of awesome people. Yes. Okay, so let, let me... I mean, okay, so Lewis Black's just one of them. Right. You also got to work with David Cross. Yep. David Cross, uh, if you don't know, um, I liked him. I didn't really know of him until Arrested Development. Right. That That's really where I think he really became a big mainstream, maybe besides his comedy, if you were a comedy fan. I didn't really know much about him until Arrested Development because I thought that was such an underrated show. Agreed. I, I thought it was hilarious. I love that show, and I thought he was so awesome in that show. And uh, anyway, so you got to work with people like him, and then uh, yeah, Mark Mark Maron, right? Is yeah, that, yeah. Now I and I again, I didn't know him for the comedy. I knew him from Glow, right? When, when he was an actor in Glow, I'm thinking that's pretty. So you got to work with some pretty big names. Yeah, yeah. I've been very, very fortunate in in who I've gotten to work with. Um, Mark Mark was just you know a really really brilliant comic. I've been on his podcast as well, and uh, you know he he's just sharp and biting and just everything that I love in comedy. Yeah. And you can tell he was like that. Cause I watched, I watched his acting and I thought he was great as, as being a producer in glow and having yeah. put together the lady, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling, you know, that was just a, that was a good show too. And he did a great job carrying that show. He's rock solid in everything he's in. Yeah. He, yeah. And how old is he now? Is he, is he almost, is he almost 70 or is he? No, I, about 60, 60. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Cool though, it's cool you got to work with some of these people. And then uh, we were talking, you got to, uh, you get to have rights to what Joan Rivers, right? I heard yeah, that. yeah. So we got, I got to work with the Joan Rivers estate. Uh, I'd been trying and trying. I was, I was hoping to actually record her and do sort of like a Rick Rubin, Johnny Cash sort of recreation of things. You know, relaunch her career with new light because I just saw that. The red carpet's great, and it was great for her publicity, but, like, her star had kind of faded a bit, so I kind of wanted to help rejuvenate things. And I was trying, I was negotiating, but, like, partway through the negotiations, her manager got fired. Okay. So then I lost contact. But then I went, I pursued her second album through Sony to try and reissue it as a way to get back in the door. And in those negotiations, I got to meet her and talk to her. And what an icon. A legend. Yeah, a legend. She's another American icon. You know, I, she had that. Remember her and her daughter? They had that live. Sh they had the reality show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great show. And uh, she, she's so funny. Even off, I mean, I, even from the Muppet movie. Remember, she was in the Muppets Take Manhattan. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, rapid fire, rapid, yeah. super sharp, quick witted. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. And, and so basically, I was negotiating for the rights, and then I got the news that she had passed. That's and, too bad. And then Sony reached out and said, you know, we, we, we have to finish these negotiations. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Let's, let's go ahead and do it. So I did that. I did a very nice poster with one of the Mondo artists to, to help push it. And then this year, and I should have brought one. I didn't even think about it. Now I feel dumb, but there, uh, there's an action figure of her through the Nacelle company in their legends of laughter series. And we uh, stand up records has done an exclusive repaint of that figure with new packaging to m kind of match the outfit that's on the, the next to last, the second to last Joan Rivers album is what the name of her album is that I reissued. Okay. So her outfit on that album cover, we m took the, the action figure and painted it to match that. Nice. It's not the same outfit, but it's the same color. Do you use comic artists for your covers for CDs and records? And stuff? I do. Um, let's talk about some of your show and tell here. Right? Okay. Well, if we're going to talk records, let's uh, <laughs> let's move this a little bit. Another this thing, tie it to comics a little bit. Now we got your life story. How awesome of a producer you are, and uh, uh, let's talk about some fun show and tell now. Yeah. So in about 2003, I realized that. Uh, I'm probably not going to be a guy that collects original art. You just not in that financial. Yeah. That's you know, a lot of money. Girl. Well, and, and this was 20 years ago. So it was before the crazy boom of the pandemic. Sure. So the way I justified buying original art was commissioning artists that I loved. Good and, idea. And, and the very first person I commissioned was mad magazines, Jack Davis. Okay. And that is this record right here, Tim Slagle's Europa. So, Literally, I got a hold of Jack Davis through his agents. They put me in touch with Jack. He had at first said no because he was retired. But uh, this was close to Christmas time. And I, and I think he must have seen a set of golf clubs that he really, really wanted because he was an avid golfer and athlete. Okay. And, and then all of a sudden that no, I'm retired became a, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Okay. So, so you commissioned it. So I commissioned it. And uh, 
he was legendarily quick. He was a, also legendarily a gentleman. I talked to him on the phone. He was great. He told me he didn't want to deal with obscenity. And I said, well, there's some rough language on this. He goes, life is hard. That part I don't care about. I just don't want it to be needlessly obscene. Okay. Okay, cool. And I said, okay, that's fine. So he, he, he sent me a proposal. He faxed me the next day after we talked. I sent him images of the comedian. He sent me a fax. A draft of the art. A fax, people. Yes, a fax. (laughs) A fax is like a cell phone that spits out paper. (laughs) Um, And anyway, I got the fax, and I I called him right away with my notes, and the next day he sent me another fax with corrections, and I approved it, and then like a week later I had the final art. That's pretty cool. That's that's how we did so many things. Yeah. It was, he was just quick, 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 and he could capture a likeness well. And you know, you can even see like his, his weird shoes. Like he always did the feet a little weird and long and you know, pointed toes. So it was a very fun experience. So from, from Jack Davis, we moved on and uh, I then hired the next uh, person on the mad list for me was Mort Drucker. Okay, this is Mort Drucker, everybody. You're seeing up here right now, Mort Drucker. Yeah, so Mort is known for all of his parody work at MAD as well. And uh, talking, I got to talk to him on the phone, he and his wife. His wife was managing him, um, and they were just like grandparents to me. Nice. They were just the so nicest. They took to you right away. Yeah, they were great. Did they spoil you with cookies? Um, no, because I didn't <laughs> live close, but I'm sure if I'd have gone over to pick up the art, Probably, you know, but we were using parents are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. They were fantastic. Jack was great too. I mean, I, I couldn't have had a better experience with both of them. That's awesome. So, you know, I figured, um, Mort did a cover for Dwight York and Dwight does, um, a lot of short jokes. So we called it quickies. (laughs) Quickies. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. And what else do you got? And from there we move on to hiring, for Keith Lowell Jensen's Elf Orgy, we hired Wendy and Richard Peeney from Elf Quest. Okay. So they went ahead and reproduced a scene, a, a controversial scene from their comic around uh, Keith telling jokes. And then they went ahead and lettered it like they lettered their cover. The wow. covers for all their art, I should say, for all their comics. And they were they were also very, very gracious and awesome to deal with. I couldn't have been happier. Nice. Yeah. And uh, from Keith's album, we move on. I have an eye that kind of wanders. I have an eye for talent of all sorts. So whether it's uh, comedians or art or bands, I I just have a really good eye on that kind of stuff. So in 2012, I started following Hip Hop Family Tree on Boing Boing by Ed Piscor, who's now more well-known for uh, X-Men Grand Design and Red Room and the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel. And I commissioned him in 2013, the year after Hip Hop Family Tree started, to do Danny Lobel's Some Kind of Comedian. Wow. Yeah. And That's uh, cool. again, really great to deal with. I'm still in touch with Ed fairly regularly. And uh, from there on the CD art, we jump and I hired um, for Glenn Wool's um, No Lands Man, I hired uh, Derek Riggs, who did all of the Iron Maiden album covers up until I. Somewhere Iron after Maiden. Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. I love Iron Maiden. Yeah, that's, me too. That's 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 bringing back some days. And Glenn <laughs> mentions Iron Maiden in his, his act a couple times. So I just figured, let's get the guy. Now I realize Derek's not a comic book artist per se. But I mean... No, that, he's still an artist. He's still an artist. Well, I mean, I hire a lot of great artists uh, outside of the realm of comic books as well. So, you know... I just had to have something by Derek Riggs because I'd missed the boat as far as um, Basil Gogos, who did all the famous monsters of film land. No. There's several, there's several prominent artists that I would have liked to have gotten that I didn't get to work with. So I wanted to make sure Derek was well. album them. covers are just as important as people buy covers of albums the same way that they do comics because the art is really cool. Exactly. So there's some, there's some commonality there. It's all eye candy, you know, uh, yeah, and, and that's you, that's the thing I like about it. Yeah, and it's great art. Beard, Iron Maiden. I didn't know that. That's a nice. You say it now, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Mind. You don't see it at first, but the minute you say it, it's like, oh man. Yeah, no kidding. The next thing we have is an, is a vinyl album by Sam Miller out of uh, Olympia, Washington, 
called Round Trip. And, and that artist is Pat Moriarty, who lived here in the Twin Cities for a while and now lives out in Seattle. He was uh, a mainstay in the early days of Fantagraphics. Okay. Um, he had a, a, a compilation comic that he ran called You and Your Big Mouth. And uh, I just have always been, I just love his style. The lines are always just so appealing and so crisp and clean. And he really captures Sam's personality. You know, Sam wanted it to have something to do with where he's from. So I made sure to have woods and, you know, Sam always likes to jump in a river. So we have him shirtless and <laughs> cool. I just think Pat's the best. And I, I just, I, I collaborate with him a lot. He's done some animated work for me as well. Cool. All right. And from there, we move on to perhaps the most controversial of the covers of what I brought. And I apologize, but this was done on purpose. Not only have I reissued stuff for Joan Rivers, I've also reissued recently three records for Richard Pryor, including this self-titled one. This doesn't want to stand. I got it. We got it. This self-titled one. And uh, the photo is a little controversial because Richard wanted to be confrontational on his first album. But the reason I brought it today is this border here that looks very much like National Geographic was illustrated by Rick Griffin, who was an underground uh, comics illustrator and very famous rock poster artist. Wow. So uh, he did like uh, the flying eyeball for Jimi Hendrix and a lot of things that you've seen a lot of places were done by Rick Griffin. He tragically died in a motorcycle accident. And I didn't know that he was involved in this album cover until the rights came through and I was working with the images and saw his name. And it just kind of blew my mind. Yeah. Well, so hey, you got two legends. I mean, yeah. Richard Pryor is such a legend of comedy to begin with, you know, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, how are you, I mean, arguably the greatest comedian, stand up comedian of all time. Oh, you definitely in the mix. And I've done three three reissues of these double deluxe vinyl LPs. Um, he's in my top five, Richard Pryor. Yeah, me too. He's he, in my top five. He's he's number one or two, you know. Yeah. So there's that, and then um, local comic artist. This is a poster for, that was also a cover for a record. Xander Cannon from Kaiju Max and Alan Moore's top 10. He did this album cover for a compilation of local comedians doing, this was all recorded uh, to be sold at convergence here in town. Okay. So we did all of this at the Monday night comedy show. I recorded, I can't believe a dozen, 13 comedians. And uh, I wanted Xander to basically mimic the FF number one, fantastic four number one. So instead of the mole man's monster, it's me <laughs> in my younger days. And uh, all the comedians are the superheroes. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And we did this, like we did a hundred copies of a double LP of this and CDs as well. But this artwork was so big and, and so appropriate for this podcast. I decided to bring it here. That is especially com comic related. Absolutely. You gotta love it. Yeah, and so even when my fandom, my direct fandom was in peaks and valleys, in valleys in particular, I never, never lost sight of that fandom. Wow. Quite a story, Dan. Now tell me, what's next? What's in the future for you now? What? You know, right now I'm, do, I'm still doing a lot of comedy. I'm, I'm actually going to start traveling later this month to go to San Francisco and then Austin, Texas to film and record. I'm, I'm doing a lot of film specials when we record the albums now. Okay. So we're getting those into digital distribution, which is a nightmare of administration work. So a lot of my creativity is going into the admin part of the business at the moment. Okay. But uh, again, we're going to be filming some stuff. I'm publishing a comic book for my uh, is that friend. The stuff here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Daniel Lobel, um, who I showed the record cover for a minute ago. He has a comic book that is basically like Harvey P. Carr's American Splendor and the fact that they're biographical. He writes the stories. He hires artists. They're not really famous artists because, you know, we're trying to do this on a budget. Sure. But uh, his first issue is literally about how he was a pen pal and phone pal with Harvey P. Carr and Harvey kind of pushed him into making comics. Okay. So... We did that issue. It sold out. This is the second printing of it here. Uh, I had it re-lettered by my friend Chris Kohler, who does a lot of inking work and, and, and trade dress. Very well known on the EC Comics group for his recreations of covers. And then uh, the guys from uh, <coughs> Keys and Grails went ahead and did the corner box for me. 
So we re, you know, this is what the old trade dress looked like. This is what the trade dress for the reissue looks like. And, uh, this comic got nominated for an award at the, uh, Jewish comic experience, which is, uh, an inaugural comic book, uh, con that happened this last year. Nice. Danny Fingeroth was part of the selection panel and we got nominated in a category called best autobiographical work. Okay. Unfortunately, there were 11 nominees and Roz from the, from the New Yorker and Art Spiegelman were in the field too. So good luck winning that one. We, yeah. we didn't win. Yeah, but you got nominated. We got nominated. That's though. an honor. So it was quite the honor. And Roz won. She deserved to win. Art doesn't really need another award. <laughs> <laughs> but, so you're going to keep at it then? You're going to keep doing stuff? Maybe, maybe yeah, pick up an yeah, award. Yeah, we, we have five issues here. I, it, the award's nice, but the, the work is more fun. Yeah. We have five issues here. It took five years to make them. We're not, we're not trying to beat down Diamond's doors. But, <laughs> no, you know, no. Yeah, so we're selling all that stuff through fairenoughcomic.com. And uh, through my website, standuprecords.com, at some point soon, fairenough.com is going uh, currently. So we're doing that. I'm sort of. You can see the website behind you, folks, uh, behind us here. So we we got that posted up. Very good. Uh, So we'll be working on that. Hopefully, I'll be working on a a compilation comic book of jokes that work visually for comedians, but not necessarily on stage. Something okay. that would work better as an illustrated story. Cool. So I, I've been working with uh, a couple people trying to assemble those ideas. That's a slow process because I'm also, you know, running a record business and dealing with all that admin work. So Man, it's a busy guy. Yeah, it's catch as catch can on that. And, and you know, we're just grinding and grinding and grinding away. I'm also working on uh, research for a series of books about uh, satire and parody in comics. Nice. And I'm hopefully going to be focusing on publishers first. Uh, individual publishers reprinting some of their public domain work, giving some analysis, cool. some you know background. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll give you some names to interview too. Hopefully, we'll see a lot of these people because you know 1950s. A lot of them have passed. Yeah, so it's a lot of reading interviews for the first book I'm, <laughs> I'm dealing with. I'm reading a stack of books. It's like four feet tall. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well. You're doing the proper research. I'm hoping. I mean, I'm not a scholar, but I'm hoping to be. Uh, Uh, You know, not wildly inaccurate. No, Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure today. Thank you for coming on our show. Uh, I really hope the fans learned a lot today. I hope all the Most Wanted Maniacs work learned a lot today. And uh, I appreciate being a customer at our store and visiting our store. Absolutely. I love coming uh, in. You're the closest comic shop to my place. Well, thank you. You're a friend of Most Wanted Comics. And uh, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. This is Dan Schleesel, everybody. And uh, you can check his website. It's posted right behind right now. And uh, make sure you check out some of the comedians he's produced and put out there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Boy, I tell you, Dan has such a good story to tell. I mean, I know some of you people are wondering, like, why did you bring him? But I tell you what, the tie from comics, from his love to comedy, to music, and how he got into the business in such a self-starter, the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. And I hope what everybody got from that is what a guy that just stuck his chin out and took risk what he accomplished in his life just because of what he was from college from his comic book love of comics tied it all into his love of, of music and, and and ended up doing his cover albums with artists from comics that he read yeah yeah inspired Plus, by art that he looked at and so between the music the comedy and the comics it was just an interesting story yeah, and plus he won a Grammy. How many people can say? Yeah, that three done that? time, three time nominated. Yeah, one time Grammy award, and it's just a major name. The fact that that now he has the rights to the Joan Rivers archive. Yeah, I mean, how cool is that? The comedy that she had. She's an American legend in comedy, so now he's got rights to that. The fact that he worked um, just just with the comedians he's worked with. I mean, those mm-hmm. are some big names that we talked about. So anyway. Uh, Thank you uh, for coming and doing that. He, he's a friend of Most Wanted Comics. He's a customer of Most Wanted Comics. We appreciate him taking time out of his busy day to talk to us. And uh, we're going to be back with the recap of The Big Game. So the Big Game. The Big Game. The Big Game. If you like this, please uh, smash the like button, subscribe, and a shout out to, of course, Matt and JD, Scott and the boys, Ryan, Jimmy, Jeff, uh, Samantha, and Laura, everyone who wanted us to give a shout out. You guys take it easy out there, and we'll talk to everybody next week.